Well, today we have a journalist who is an independent writer, independent researcher. He's written as a columnist for the Epic Times, Uncovered DC, and he is someone who covers a whole variety of topics. And it's his birthday today, so we're going to celebrate our guest, Brian Cates. How you doing? Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Now, I understand it's your birthday, so we're going to look at some of the work overview of your work today. Uh, your your Substack is briancates.substack.com. And, uh, you know, I always start off my radio broadcast saying, from the heart of Central Florida, it's great to be here live on A Neighbor's Choice. So, Brian, I know you're from Central Florida, too, now, so I thought you'd like that little reference to our area here. Yeah, I, I moved here about uh, a year and a half ago from Texas, and I now live in Lakeland here. And uh, I think we're, we're both in Polk County. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So how do you like living here in Florida compared to Texas? Well, Texas is, is great. I, I, I will always be a Texan, you know, and uh, it's, it's where my roots are. But um, I, I visited Lakeland uh, about uh, – would have been January of uh, 2022, mm -hmm. and uh, I was attending some events here in the area. There was something in Plant City, mm -hmm. and there was an event in Orlando, and then uh, another one in Miami Beach. And so I, I stayed here in Lakeland for like a month and a half while I attended these events down here in Florida, and I just fell in love with the place, and I went back to Texas at the end of February of 2022, and I said, "Well, you know, um, I'm I miss Florida, so I decided I would move here. And uh, Lakeland is a great town. Um, it, there's so much to do here, and I've just had a blast for the last year and a half." Well, you know, it's your birthday today, so it's always a great time to reflect on your life work. How long have you been doing uh, political writing and research? And what do you see as your crowning achievement so far? Well, I I kind of looked into the whole um, political columnist thing uh, for many years. Uh, I was kind of like uh, I knocked around a bit after I got out of uh, Bible college in 1985. I went and I, I lived uh, in the U.S. Virgin Islands for seven years. I helped pastor a church there. And then uh, I learned how to do pet shop stuff because we supported ourselves with a with a pet shop. And then I went home to help take care of my mom in her declining years. And I, I went from uh, working in another pet shop. I kind of became an engraver for seven years. And then uh, I discovered Twitter. That would have been about uh, 2000, 2010 or so. I discovered Twitter and I started getting inter interested in politics. I started following politics more closely, and um, I, I uh, was a big fan at the time of columnist Ann Coulter, and I started hanging out on the Ann Coulter uh, message board, and I used to do a lot of what, what we do now on Twitter, write these long Twitter threads. I, I actually started doing that on the Ann Coulter site, um, on, on the message board there, so from about... Um, Two or three years I did that. I started my own blog because I got interested in, uh, in covering the uh, Obama versus the Romney race. And um, I got invited to write for Breitbart.com uh, shortly after he passed away. And I actually did a couple of, you can probably still find them up on the site. I did a couple of uh, unpaid uh, contributor pieces for them. And then I just knocked around and did my own blog for a couple of years. And then uh, when Trump showed up in 2015, and he just changed the entire political scene by coming down that golden escalator. And I was never Trump during that. <laughs> I, I, I was against Trump. I, I was a good uh, captured uh, NRO, you know, conservative incorporated uh you know, conservative for those, those uh, years when Trump was running. He he actually became president, and I watched him uh, be, be president for a couple of months. I realized uh, everything I'd been told about the guy was wrong. 
And while I was in the middle of that uh, revelation, that's when the Spygate story hit. And uh, I've always been good at research. I've always been good at uh, picking stuff up and uh, find, finding uh, finding documents and things like that on the internet. Uh, I'm a very good, a very dogged researcher. And so by 2017, uh, by mid, the middle of 2017, I'm a mess in the Spygate scandal. You know, James Comey's been fired. Uh, the Mueller Special Counsel has begun. It's coming out that they've been spying on Trump. They spied on Trump during his campaign. And they're uh, they're plotting against him, you know, and uh, and they're, 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 they're obviously trying to take him take him out. And I was uh, I was on Twitter. I had had about uh, three hundred thousand followers at that time in twenty seventeen. I fell into this group of really great researchers. We had our own Twitter DM room, and we would share our research with each other. And this is how I got my start. I could say this is where it started. It started with Spygate because we never had anything like this. I mean, uh, when you have the outgoing administration is deliberately spying on and trying to undermine the incoming administration. And so that's that's how I got started then. And what has been your highlight of your career thus far? Well, I... I would say it was it would be getting uh, invited to to write a guest column for the Epoch Times in July 2018. I've been doing long threads where I would go over not just my research but research of people like uh, Tracy Baines, Harold Rand, uh, Technofog. There, there were a lot of really dedicated people that were doing this research. The mainstream media was completely covering this wrong, like you know Trump. Trump was, uh, was lying about all of this. There was there was no spying on Trump. Russiagate is you know the, there really was collusion. They were going with that narrative that the the Russian collusion Trump was being accused of was real, and that's how they were covering it. And so I was I was writing long threads demonstrating that uh, Spygate was a hoax that was started by the Clinton campaign. That uh, Christopher Steele and uh, Glenn Simpson of, of Fusion DPS, they were employed by the Clinton campaign, who used the Perkins Cooley Law Firm as a cutout to hide the fact that the, the, the Clinton campaign was behind all of this. And they would shop the dossier to the news media, who just took it without any question. And the FBI took, seemed to have taken it without any question. And despite knowing that it came straight from a political campaign, they took it and they lost uh, FISA warrants and investigations based on this. And uh, I was doing threads on that, and I got invited to do a guest column for the Epoch Times. I say that that would be the highlight because that's what put me on the map. And I ended up being uh, a columnist there for about two and a half years, and I, I did I did almost uh, four or five columns for them a month. And that's what really put me on the map. Wow. Um, well, how about Paul Sperry? He's a senior reporter at RealClearInvestigations.com. dot com. Did you work with him? Yeah, uh, I do not work with him. No, but I'm familiar with him. I've I've never done any work with Real Clear Investigations. But uh, Paul is an excellent re uh, researcher. He's often breaking news. And he has his own his own style, his own way of uh, getting attention for stories that he thinks are being overlooked. So I have a lot of respect for Paul Sperry, but I have never worked with him. We follow each other on Twitter. That's about the extent of our connection. Um, well, I want to dive into some of the things you mentioned with Spygate. One of the things that was a big red flag for me was the ridiculousness surrounding people's inquiry into the death of a gentleman named Seth Rich. Did you investigate that story, and what are your conclusions based on the facts? Well, I I have, you cannot look into Spygate and all the, all the weird things going on around it without encountering the Seth Rich story. Um, the Obama administration uh, erected a house of cards, I call it a house of cards, it was very important to the outgoing Obama administration that everybody buy the narrative that the DNC emails were stolen by Russian hackers. They invested a lot into that narrative, getting people to buy it. 
because it's the basis for a lot of things that flowed in, during the transition period. If you recall, the reason General Flynn is on the phone with Sir J. Kissel, yet, the, uh, the Western ambassador at the time, the reason he's on the phone down there with the guy in the Dominican Republic is because Obama had expelled about 30 Western diplomats from the United States. And this was retaliation because you guys, your hackers, stole those Western emails and then used that to embarrass Hillary Clinton and you interfered in our election. And so Obama expels 30 Western diplomats. And so because the new administration's coming in, Flynn trying to make sure that the Russians do not overreact to this provocation because they know they didn't do anything. The, the, the emails were not actually stolen by Western hackers. They were downloaded by an insider, by a whistleblower. Yeah, I person. interviewed William Benny, the former NSA tech director, who proved that with his research and experiments, that it was not right. conducive to a transfer, but rather an instant download internally. And so they they want to cover that up. They want whoever it was, whoever it was that actually took those emails and took them to Julian Assange and gave them to WikiLeaks. They do not want that coming out. So they came up with this cover story about Western hackers and uh, and to to add weight to that cover story, they expelled all these diplomats. And then so Michael Flynn, General Michael Flynn, the incoming NSA director, is trying to calm things down. So he calls Sir J. Kisselyak on the phone and they have a conversation. And this is what Joe Biden and um, Barack Obama, they used that, the transcript of that phone call we leaked to the Washington Post in January of 2017. And this was used in there because uh, people, they were still trying to set the narrative. The only way Trump could possibly win was that the Russians helped him cheat. And there was Russian collusion. And oh, wow, here's General Flynn on the phone with the Russian ambassador. What kind of secret deal were they doing? And so it's just a violation of the Logan Act. And so that's how they started this whole thing it all tied together. And so the DNC emails and Seth Rich and who many people believe was this whistleblower. They believe he was the one that used the thumb drive to take these highly damaging. I mean, and the, um, I know a lot of people say the DNC emails caused Hillary to lose that election. I'm not so sure if that's the case, but I know it did do tremendous damage. What was revealed in those emails, which, which led right to Pizzagate and some other things that happened that were revealed that they were rigging everything for Hillary, that uh, that their own delegates didn't matter, the, the votes that they were making didn't matter. The whole process was rigged from A to Z. And that, so those emails were highly damaging. And so if they want to lay down a false trail as to how those emails got to Julian and Sang. And this is one reason a lot of people don't want to see Julian Assange extradited. They don't want to see him ever talk because he's the one guy in the whole world that can, that he knows who the source was. He knows who the person was that gave him the DNC email. And it was not, he's already been he's on the record. He didn't specifically identify who it was, but he did say it's not a state actor and it was not arrested. Yeah. It's fascinating that in ancient societies, one of the things they would do before Christianity came into the scene is they would lay, and they did it a little bit afterwards, but it started to fade out faster, was they would lay a human sacrifice on underneath the cornerstone of the building of a new temple or a new wall or a new city. And this was the cornerstone sacrifice where you would lay a human being, sometimes alive or dead, on the corner, underneath the cornerstone of a new project to inaugurate, to bless, to consecrate this new endeavor. And I feel like Seth Rich is the cornerstone sacrifice of this entire Spygate facade, this entire anti-Russia, you know, hysteria that they've built since then. They, they've had, they've invested so much. I mean, if you look at it now, it's kind of ludicrous that they're bringing this back. It's, it's, you know, there were two special counsels that looked into this. You had Robert Mueller, for all his faults, Robert Mueller did a fantastic job of demonstrating with his report and his testimony before Congress. He could not find a single shred of any Russian collusion, any collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. He could not find it. 
He had Andrew Wiseman and all the cat dogs out there. I mean, it got so bad they were even digging through the long deceased Fred Trump's estate taxes, trying to find something that they could they could use, and they couldn't find anything. And then on top of that, we had the John Durham special counsel, which went in there and showed how basically this whole thing was the was a, a political dirty trick. The whole Trump Russia collusion and hoax was a political dirty trick launched straight from the Hillary Clinton campaign back in back in 2015. And so this this was this was all fake. Everybody involved knew it was fake. Don't prove that. And yet here we are, it's 2024. Trump's coming back. Trump is Trump is uh, he just had a magnificent Super Tuesday. And he he's uh, he he's coming back and he's stronger than ever. He's more robust than ever, and Biden is fading. Biden is obviously struggling mentally. They're terrified. And so what do they do? They bring back Russia, Russia, Russia. They're trying to bring it back. And it's just it's, it just shows you how desperate they are and the fact that they there's not a whole lot of other things left in the toolbox here if they're having to pull out this same narrative yeah. that they were using back in 2016. That's already been debunked. And yet here they are, and they're they're rolling it out again. It's, to, to me, it's just ludicrous. Why do you think Donna Brazile dedicated her book uh, to Seth Rich? I actually wasn't aware that she'd done that. Yeah. She dedicated a book to Seth Rich. Yeah. Was this before or after he was... It's after he died, is it in memory of Seth Rich, the opening of her book? Okay, the... yeah. So that may have been made it sound like you know she she worked with him and he was he was tragically killed. Yeah. So she just she just condoned. Yeah. Okay, or yeah. was she sending a message to? Was she sending a message to her internal rivals that I've got the goods huh. so behave? Yeah. yeah. I actually did not know that, Dan. That yeah. she wrote a book where she she did that. Yeah. Um. So it's amazing to see all this news coming out about uh, they're trying to bring a thing, extradited thing right now to the United States. And um, I don't want him talking about who, who the real source is. That it, and uh, the FBI is refusing to hand over Seth Rich's laptop and the information that was on it. They're actually defying a court order at this point, I believe. A court, a judge has ordered them to hand it over, and they're refusing to reply, uh, to comply with that. On top of that, we have all this, this uh, uh, may not seem like it's kind of related, but it is. The Hunter Biden laptop is, is related in the fact that Hunter Biden was, was deeply involved in uh, operations in Ukraine uh, having to do with bio labs. Um, and they were so, and the whole time Trump was in office for that first term, uh, they were so determined, they were so worried about him finding out what was, what, what the, not just the Bidens, but what for the Bidens and all these other people were up to in the current, that uh, that's why they did that first impeachment. They were trying to hide all this stuff from him. And then he he I think he uh, he baited them in that phone call with Zelensky, with Zelensky went unexpectedly you know the comedian the actor uh, won the election, and Trump says uh, by the way I I, I want to ask you about the server they say Ukraine has it and speaking of the DNC server, and it's going right at the crowd strike narrative the big crowd strike narrative, because that that's the point that I was going to make. That um, CrowdStrike, they base all the uh, the narrative that Russian hackers broke into the DNC server and stole that stuff. It's based on a CrowdStrike report. Basically, the DNC never let the FBI or anybody else examine that, that server, just CrowdStrike, just a third party that they paid. That released wow. the report that we are experts definitely say the Russian a Russian hacking group called Fancy Bear did this. And, and so when the moment Trump starts asking questions about the DNC server ban and Ukraine, they all of them listening in on that phone call, Colonel Venman, all all these others, they freaked out. And they they went and they they engineered that first impeachment using that fake CIA whistleblower Eric Ciarmarella. 
What, you know, a lot of folks say that Trump has is a representative of a very powerful faction within government, but yet, you know, none of the people who have been a part of this network of deep, deep evil and crime, uh, harming of children, uh, trafficking of children, murder of Seth Rich and millions of others. These are sick, sadistic psychopaths. And yet, you know, whether it's the Durham investigation or, you know, the uh, the um, the inspector general report, you never really see any. No one's landing a blow on these six psychopaths. When is that ever happening and, and why hasn't it happened yet? Well, I think a lot of this stuff that's been going on is, is dumped under below the surface. Um, I know Jeff Sessions gets a lot of hate. He gets a lot of grief. He gets called, and people say he was useless, that he didn't do anything. But the fact is, um, I think a lot of the things that Trump and Jeff Sessions were doing on uh, human trafficking and child sex trafficking, and they had actually gotten the fentanyl traffic under control. They uh, they spent most most of the the first three years of Trump's term from 2017 to 2019 uh, combating human trafficking and getting the, the flow of drugs under control while also getting the the the, the border wall started. Um, so Jeff Sessions gets a lot of grief, but I think there were a lot of things that were done un, under the surface. Now I know a lot of people that want to see bigger lifts, they want to see the Epstein client lifts, they want to see. Um, they they want to see everybody that, that went to that island uh, that abused the kids there. They want to see them arrested. And I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an unpopular opinion. This is I've been saying this for a while now. A lot of people don't believe it. Okay, the reason the Epstein case and then what became the Gil Gillen Maxwell case, the reason that, that case is run out of the Southern District of New York Public Corruption Unit. It's because that investigation is not over. That case is not over. Epstein and Maxwell were own business. They've been dealt with, and the investigation is continuing. They're looking into the public officials who were involved, who were bribed. They looked the other way back in 2008, 2009. I think eventually we're going to hear from these people. And uh, I know a lot of people don't believe that, but you know, if you think about it, Epstein was one of the protected princes. He was one of the people that you cannot touch. He had, um, what do they call him, tripwires. He had tripwires all around him. You do not even get to approach a guy like that. And yet somehow they opened up a case on him. They, they reopened the case on him. And they uh, they they managed to arrest, file an arrest warrant and get and had when he flew into that uh, airport, Tudorboro, New Jersey, and they arrested him. Okay, uh, that shows you that there's some things going on there because this is the guy. This is the kind of guy that thing doesn't ha that sort of thing does not happen to. You do not sneak up on a Jeffrey Epstein. You don't sneak up on a John Luke Brunel either. The other guy who also, strangely enough, hanged himself in his uh, French jail cell about a year after Jeffrey Epstein. It's amazing how these guys end up killing themselves in their jail cells. Um, so I think there's a lot of things going on here that uh, uh, this stuff is, if you just look at it from the surface and take what you see on the surface, yeah, this looks bad. It looks like nothing is happening. And uh, but I think there are some things happening behind the scenes. It's not a popular uh, opinion. But I think that uh, there are people still investigating the Epstein. And the reason you can't see the Epstein client list is that, is that this is a massive thing. There are hundreds and hundreds of deeply influential, wealthy, and powerful people involved in this. And they're all being investigated. And so you're not going to see the client list until the investigation is over. And how do we? But who's in charge of that district there? And how do we know they're not going to just be another, uh, you know, uh, fake, you know, investigation that does a light sentencing and a cleanup job. Well, if you consider Gillian, Gillian Maxwell getting 20 years in prison, some kind of cover-up, uh, I, I don't know I don't know the name of the person who runs the Southern District of New York's Public Correction Unit. I don't have that information. Yeah. 
but um, I know that, that it was very strange that there was a uh, Geoffrey Berman was the uh, was the district attorney. Uh, I'm trying to remember what role he had, but Berman wouldn't leave. Like I remember William Barr was saying he's bringing in somebody else's else in, and Berman said, "Well, I'm not leaving." Um, and it created this weird situation. Okay, when, when, when Berman said he wasn't leaving, this was in late, I think, late 2018. This was happening, and Berman was refusing to leave the office, refusing to be fired. Okay, he was refusing the grace period to get out. So Trump had to actually fire him to get this other guy in there. And it was like a month and a half later, they left Epstein, and then they they leave Gillian Maxwell. And the one that's that's another thing that people don't remember. I'm probably the one of the only reporters in America that remembers this. At the press conference, they told you uh what point blank. We always knew where she was. For nine months she was supposedly in the wind, staying at that tucked little tucked away estate. Okay, they always knew where she was, they always knew who she was meeting with. And and uh, they were keeping tabs on her. So she was never lost. It was not like they, they never knew where she was. And she's even seen, at one point, she's photographed sitting in an um, uh, outdoor cafe-like restaurant reading a book uh, about famous dead CIA agents. Yeah. And so there were things going on here. I know that... Uh, it seems strange when when you talk about them, and uh, everybody just goes, "Oh, there's nothing happening here. Oh, what happened by now? Oh, uh, oh, we'll never see that client list. They all got away, and that's the that's the conventional wisdom. And uh, I'm not sure that's accurate. Do you believe Vivek will be the VP pick for Trump, and what does he represent? <laughs> now, that's a good question, and uh, damn, because. And initially, I would look at uh, Vivek and I'd go, it struck me as a new car salesman. Yeah. Uh, they, they, he, he will say anything to anybody yeah. to appeal to them. Yeah. But then I watched this guy work when he when the media challenges him and goes after him. He's a very effective advocate. They would try to ask him a gotcha question. He, he would just uh, eat them alive. And uh, he's very effective in working with the press. So... I actually do not want to see Vivek as the uh, vice president, but I do see a major role for him in uh, a second Trump administration. I'd love to see that guy be the press secretary. We trade out that Karen Jean Pierre, I think her name is. We trade her out for Vivek Ramaswamy. So every day, that what that White House press corps, you know, those. <laughs> the fake news people have to go in there every day and deal with this guy. And they try to try to ask him the dumb questions and watch him uh, fence with them verbally. That would be a good role for him. Uh, as vice president, I think he'd be pretty much wasted. He uh, he has a lot of uh, media public relations talent, okay? I think as, as, a v, as a VP, it kind of be like the wrong role for him. That's just my opinion. Uh, some people think he's uh, a kind of backed by a lot of the PayPal mafia, the Gen X people who are pro-America, and uh, that he might be a bargaining asset. Basically, you put our guy in, Trump, so that we can do things the way we wanted to do, and uh, we'll come in with the money. Because Elon Musk is talking to Trump. Peter Thiel has said he's not putting any money into Trump. I think, I think this is a bargaining deal that they're doing where they're saying – because Peter Thiel did this story where he said, I was not happy with the personnel decisions for Trump administration. And so he was he was staying out of it. And there was a story that Trump was mad at him for saying that. But I do believe it could be a bargaining uh, negotiation going on where, because Vivek, remember his book, he was associated with uh, Thiel. And I, I wonder if, you know, Musk and David Sachs, who's been speaking against the Ukraine war and against the border chaos, Musk and Teal, these PayPal mafia type guys, Vivek may be their guy saying, look, you you put Trump, you put him in there so we can execute some of the things we want to do in the administrative state. And we will come in with the investment of, of for your reelection. I wonder if that's what's going on. 
Well, I I see a lot of forces at play here. Um, the, 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 um, David Sachs and Musk have been, and that other guy, the one who they they did that hit piece on his wife, and he's a suing Business Insider for defamation. They've been very good at laying out the cases, not just for free speech, but also, like you mentioned, against the Ukraine war. And um, it cannot be overstated the dramatic impact that Musk has has, has had on the uh, political, it's not, just, it's not just politics, the entire public discourse by buying Twitter yeah. Uh, what, what's happened in the last year and a half on that platform? Because uh, you know the bad guys used to have total control. All these, all these platforms belonged to them. They had total control of them. You know, uh, I'm sure you're familiar that Facebook started out as DARPA, a DARPA research project called LifeLog, and they ended LifeLog the same day Facebook launched, and they put this nerdy college kid in the public face. Of Facebook, you know, they didn't want the new people would not would not be open to downloading Facebook to their devices, and they basically putting their whole life on there. If they knew this was a spy tool developed by the Pentagon, or developed by the well, I guess Mike Brown calls it the blob. But he he, he says that you make a mistake when you think of the State Department, the Pentagon, and the CIA as three separate entities. It's all one entity, so he calls it the blob. And I think that that that's a very effective analogy. Um, so we have a conversation now. We have things that we can talk about now. Where just two years ago, when they were so determined to censor everybody and control everybody's speech, while the the COVID pandemic was underway, and they the twenty twenty election was uh, was 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 coming, and, and they they needed to control. The, dis the public discourse, both before, during, and after the election, to keep, to keep people from talking about, okay? And so I see Musk and David Sachs and these, these other guys. I know a lot of people have some negative views of them. They're, they're, all, they're all playing if they're not really for free speech. I, I know Elon gets a lot of criticism. But I look at where things were in the public discourse just a year and a half ago versus where they are now. And this, this is like the difference between night and day. I, I can talk about stuff on, on uh, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of other people can't. We can talk about stuff on X now that would have gotten you instantly suspended just two years ago. Yeah. Where uh, you, you were not allowed to have a real conversation. The hall monitors were everywhere. They were watching you. And uh, so it's much better now. I think it's going to dram it dramatically impacted the political discourse in this country. And it's already showing an impact on this coming election. Yeah, uh, you you on your uh, Twitter page you have a pinned post where you say the biggest problem faced by those trying to take General Flynn down, along with all those working with him, exposing the critical Ukrainian, Israeli, CIA intel networks that protect the human trafficking and the human trafficking profits, is that the drug-addled operatives they were forced to resort to using are unstable as in they tend to self-destruct early and aren't very effective. Yeah, that's my pen post on my, on my X page. Tell me what that, tell me, unpack that story. I'm not familiar with what you're referencing there. You have a picture of these guys, but I don't, I don't know this story. Okay, that's a picture of Greg Phillips, uh, who's never worked for two to vote. He's an independent contractor. And that's a picture of a guy who goes by, the screen name of the the authority queue. And these people were heavily involved in an event that I was invited to back in August of 2022. It was called The Pit in Arizona. And I went there. And the, I'm going to tell you, this is my present opinion. It took me a while to come to, come to this opinion after watching what unfolded over the last year and a half when the authority and... Uh, I'm, I'm, you're probably familiar as a podcaster yourself with the NG show within the Matrix, uh, Jeff Peterson and Shady Groove, who do the NG show. Uh, these people were uh, directly involved and in, in, uh, in helping run the pit, and, and they were at the pit. That's why I met them. I met them. That's the first place I met the authority. 
first place, first time I met Greg Phillips. And so what happened, or has happened over the next year and a half, is that uh, Authority, Matrix, Jeffy Peterson, and Shannon Townsend, he goes by City Group, uh, I was part of a group called We the Media, okay? And it turned out that they had infiltrated We the Media. They made up a lot of lies about us, and they attacked our group, and they tried to take it down. And then they they went after Badlands Media. They went after uh, John Harold and Kate, my good friend um, Kate. And um, they tried to take down Badlands Media. And then about a year ago, as if they hadn't, you know, they hadn't, they hadn't shown enough by that point. They decided to turn on General Flynn and claim that General Flynn is a human trafficking statement, that he is a key member of the deep state. So I bought into all of this. I was hoping to research it. Um, and I come to the conclusion it, it's all a lope. It's all, it's all a massive distraction. It's all something that was that was created to get the best of the Anon community, not just the Q, Q community. So there are people that are on the Anon community that do not subscribe to the uh, the Q drop. They don't believe in that. But they got the best researchers and diggers of the Anon community. They assembled them at the pit, and then I think they led them down a rabbit hole. And so a lot of people like me spent wasted like months of our time uh, looking into this conic stuff, and then I realized that from from the very beginning, even though I was in the research room and it looked like they were finding this stuff, they were finding conic stuff on uh, websites in Michigan and places like this, uh, I realized Greg Phillips is out there guiding authority and all these other researchers. He's showing them where to go look for it, where to find it. So literally everything having to do with conic came through FBI informant Greg Phillips and this other still unnamed FBI informant who he met in that hotel room. I, I don't see uh, this is probably too much background for some people. But uh, Greg Phillips met with this guy, uh, another FBI informant in a hotel room. And this is where the connect stuff came from, supposedly. This is where it all came from. So it all runs through Greg Phillips. It all runs through him. It, they were ordered by the court to show what evidence they had, and they didn't show anything. They they came back and they came out and said, "Well, we." we, we Is this that group that was connected to uh, Dinesh D'Souza's movie, The Mules? Yeah, this is this is kind of this is the so they're so, so you're saying these guys were not, were up to no good. I'm not familiar with this story at all. So yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm just saying okay. It's, seemed to me that this was a rabbit hole, that this didn't lead anywhere. Does that and, mean that they were assets of some disinformation campaign, or were they just... I have ignorant? no idea. I don't know the result that happened. They were, they actually had a put-up or shut-up moment in court in Atlanta about two weeks ago, and they didn't show anything. They showed nothing. So they had another chance to blow the lid off of this if they had anything, and they, they could not do it. So do you think they were just so there's, grifters? There's another reason I'm bringing this up, Dan, is because these operatives who are very close to Greg Phillips, they work with them, Authority, Jeff Peterson, Shannon Townsend, they spent the last couple of months doxing all the Anons, for many of the Anons, the top Anons that were involved in this. They're doxing people now, so the whole thing has just turned ugly, and I had enough of it, and that's why you see that pen post there. Because I'm I'm convinced that this was an operation. It was to guide everybody down a rabbit hole, stop them from doing what they were effectively doing, and lead them into wasting their time. And so they've been using as authority as a drug addict. He's uh, you know, I'm not going to go any any further than that. But they pick people like uh, authority. They pick people like uh, like Lynn Wood has his followers, like called the Bread Crew. They're all drug addicts that now they've all turned on each other. They're unstable, okay? And they, I guess they seem to have some sort of operation here where they were going to try to turn the Anon community and the MAGA community against General Flynn there. And they thought yeah, well, that they would be able to accomplish this. And these guys are so unstable and they're so, they're so incompetent at what they do that 
they're all toning on each other. And so yeah. that's why I made that post. What's the story about Lynn Wood? He was just saying all kinds of stuff. And then he just, just kind of took the stage, right? He left. Yeah. Lynn Wood. Uh, I, I was calling at Lynn Wood when calling at Lynn Wood wasn't cool. I mean, because it was back in shortly after the election theft, he was brought in and, and, and I, I, I want to research that someday, how somebody opened the door and left this snake in there. He comes in, he puts on a red MAGA cap, and then he starts deliberately telling people not to vote in the Senate runoff with the Senate seats in Georgia. He starts telling people not to vote. And then it gets, it gets worse from there. He uh, he started chopping this transcript that he said that he, he hadn't got from a whistleblower named Ryan Dart White. Who, who turned out to be a guy named Dr. Jonathan Negree that he claims he's a doctor. And he made all kinds of wild claims that um, this Ryan Dark White fellow did about secret encrypted videotapes showing children being murdered and that, and that uh, Lynn Wood claimed he had the encryption for these videos. And that when he and he was he's making trying to give them to the proper authority. And he was spinning all this bullshit. And what happened, what you discovered, Dan, when you dug into Ryan Dark White, is this guy was a petty drug dealer. He 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 uh, he dealt an oxy and all these pain uh pain medication pills. And he got busted by Rod Rosenstein and the DEA in Baltimore. And so the first time you find this Dr. John the Greedy guy on, on the radar, if you go back and look at this. Um, is when he approached Cheryl Atkinson. Cheryl Atkinson had been claiming had, had, had somebody hack into her laptop, that hacked into her computers, and, and she was looking to, to, to find out who had been doing that. And so Dr. McGreevy approaches her and says, I know who that was. That was that was Rod Rosenstein and the Dirty Trick Squad in Baltimore, the same guy that framed me for being an oxy dealer and sent me to prison for three and a half years. Okay, and so this guy made a little cottage industry over the next two or three years. Whenever anybody had the question about something like, who hacked Cheryl Atkinson's computer? Who killed Seth Rich? Um, this guy would show up and he had the same answer no matter what the question was. You ask him the question, he goes, Rod Rosenstein and the Dirty Trick Squad in Baltimore. They're the ones that did it. See, he's on a revenge tour. But, and, and, and if you look at the transcript that he that he provided, he names Ro Rosenstein and the two DEA agents that sent him to prison. Because they found something like 20,000 oxy pills or whatever it was in his apartment when they busted him and sent him to prison. And so... And now Lynn Wood started hyping this guy like he was credible. And so with this was like by the summer of 2020, I'm having to get out there and say, no, look, I know this guy's tweeted like he's some kind of star in the election integrity movement, but this guy's a fucking snake, all right? You need to stop listening to this guy. Plus, he's crazy, okay? If you looked into the background of Lynn Wood, he already turned on all his law partners. His own children want nothing to do with him. I mean, he he uh, he shows all he he would. They actually have video, uh, not video, audio recordings of him talking, you know, calling his law partners up in the middle of the night. Saying, maybe I'm God. How would you know? You know, uh, maybe you're messing with Jesus. Uh, you know, and it's just crazy stuff. And so all this, all the signs was out there that he was unstable. And, and him, him and Sid, him and Sidney Powell were on TV every night before. Uh, uh, January sixth, remember? Every night they were on national television. I don't. I don't buy any of that. I think. I think they. I don't know. Yeah, he, I, I don't think anybody knew at that point just how just how off the wheels Lynn Wood would go, and he he was the first one to turn on General Flynn. This was about it. two years ago. Now he, he suddenly made made a big stink over the seven rays of light per, and tried to claim that General Flynn is a saintness. And he had this habit of, uh, you know, most of his followers on Telegram are fake. But there are some people, they're very impressed by somebody who constantly speaks in what I call the religious authoritative voice. They always speaks. It's like this is what cult leaders do. He speaks in the religious authoritative voice at all times. Um, 
And some people were impressed by that. I mean, you can quote the Bible a lot, and he, he gives off this flair of being very religious. And uh, he's not the only guy that's been that's been doing that in the election integrity movement. But he was one of the first ones that I think a lot of people realized, yeah, there's something wrong about this guy. And uh, so, but I was one of the first ones to start calling him out, saying, you know, this every, every he's, he's hyping this Ryan white dark, this Ryan dark white guy, and this transcript doesn't make any sense at all. Who, so who do you think Trump's going to pick as his VP candidate, and uh, or who do you want, and who do you think he'll pick? Well, I think he's going to. If I totally lay all my emotions aside, and I look at what who is politically the best pick he could possibly make, and I understand or if Kate Jr. brings a lot of baggage to to the ticket. Because, you know, we all know he's pro-abortion and he is uh, pro-gun control and he's 100% uh, 100, 100 into climate change. Okay, but if it was made clear, that, you know, Trump's in the driver's seat. Trump's the one that's setting the policy for the administration. But he brings in RFK Jr., not just as, the, as, as the, uh, a backup, or some, you know, a, a running mate, but somebody who will play an effective role and media relations, and also handling the out of control rogue health and medical agencies in our government who, who, who have completely been compromised and co opted by Big Pharma. I mean, nobody is better on the issue of, um, of Big Pharma and, and, and the COVID vaccines. And he, he's even good on the Ukraine war. I mean, he's so good on so many policies. Okay, so the, the, it's easy to focus just on where we disagree with him. Yeah. But if it was made clear he's just bringing, he's being brought on board to assist Trump and what Trump wants to do, and he stay, stays in his lane, uh, RFK Jr. is the one that helps helps Trump uh, really break this thing wide open and win, win this, uh, because he'll pull in so, he's got something like 9 to 14% of the vote right now, mostly yeah. from Democrats. Yeah. If he brings that over to Trump, I mean, Biden got he doesn't even have a ghost of a shot. Yeah. And so I would say politically wise, that'd be the best call. Now, personally, I'm hoping Trump doesn't do that. I think Trump can still win if he gets somebody like Christy Noam or Carrie Lake is willing to drop her uh, Senate bid. Uh, Christy Noam, uh, Carrie Lake, and Dr. Ben Carson. Okay, all of those would be good choices. Um, because RFK, I think, would be better if we dropped him in at the uh, the NIH or head of the FDA, one of those things, and let him vote it all down. Just like I want to see General Flynn put in charge of uh, the, the DNI, Director of National Intelligence, and I want him to burn the CIA down to the ashes and all mm -hmm. these other rogue intelligence, intelligence agencies. So... I think, in my heart, I want to see uh, Christy know I'm a carry late. And do you um, do you do you see a um, a, a situation where uh, they're still going to find a way to uh, to pull some kind of uh, you know I don't know some kind of October surprise type thing to try to really uh, on steroids kind of thing because okay. like they did they did that they they're pulling out all the stops nowadays to try to keep their power here. Well, Dan, you know, desperate people do desperate things. And I've been saying for a while now, um, almost nothing of the last three years has gone the way that uh, Trump's opponents hoped it would. They had hoped, you know, I came up with a rather clever clever uh, phrase to describe this. They hoped all the lawfare and the January 6th stuff, the, the, the year-long hearings about January 6th, and and uh, being being uh, indicted all these times, uh, they had hoped that this would have reduced Trump to the political equivalent of being a bubbling pool of toxic radioactive waste by now. And it hasn't happened. He's more popular than ever. He, he's growing his base. Nothing, you know, the lawfare hasn't really paid off. They had some huge judgments in New York City, you know. They had that big judgment in the and from Judge Eng, Engelron, and they had a, they had the E. Jean Carroll defamation judgment, which Trump is of course he's appealing both of those. 
But the idea was make him toxic, make him untouchable by now. And it has not happened. So now people talk about how, well, they'll swap Biden now. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll just, you know, convince Biden to shuffle off into the sunset and they'll drop somebody else in there. Uh, some people think it'll be Michelle Obama. Uh, but I doubt that. Some people think it, they tried with somebody like uh, Gavin Newsom. But, but my thinking on that is, that they waited too long, if this ever was the plan. Oh boy, have they waited too long. And any attempt to swap by it now at this point is, you know, people try to start it like, oh, it would be so smart. It would be so yeah. clever if they do that. It would be like a Machiavellian checkmate move. You know, Trump will be trapped. Okay, that's not actually how it would come across to the yeah. American public if they swap by it now at this point. This is what I said in the column. Yeah, it would look like a dirty trick. You know, I think they would understand. I think it would backfire even more, you know. This this will come across as a uh, desperation, sweat-covered, uh, yeah. frantic act trying to stab off total defeat. This yeah. is how it's, it's not going to be some Machiavellian. We, we're in total control. We swap Biden now. Yeah. Look how clever we are. Oh my God! Oh my God! We're losing the COVID. Yeah. Oh my God! We have to we have to swap him out. He can't win. It doesn't look like a power yeah, move. Him, get yeah. out there! <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like a power move. It looks like a like you said. I think it. I don't. I think it would backfire on whoever they put in. Yeah. Yeah, it will not be a power move. It's a sweat covered desperation move. Yeah. If they do it, and they may not. So, um, there are other things that they could try. Um, they they could try to delay the election. People talk about the all the illegals they're letting in here. They're starting to realize that uh, you have the eight million. Some people say it's eleven million. We this is this is what's so bad about this. We have no idea how many of the actually is that they let in here uh, since since Biden was sworn in. We don't know how many there how many millions it is. But the, you have the Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland coming out and saying. The federal government now. We're going to start putting pressure on the states to get rid of those voter ID laws. Those voter ID laws are a real problem. And we're going to get rid of those voter ID laws. And so it's going to be easier to cheat than ever if they manage to pull that up. And, uh, and, you know, there'll be a lot of litigation over the next eight months if they have to try this. But uh, I brought up the point the other day, assuming that they do try to use these illegal um what they'll do is, you know, mail-in ballots, uh, they already admitted in Georgia. Nobody checks the signatures on these damn things. Uh, nobody checks these signatures on these uh, mail-in ballots. There's no security whatsoever. In fact, if you get a mail-in ballot uh, uh, and you're an illegal alien, all you have to do, there's a question on there, you know, on, on, on the form, are you a U.S. citizen? Okay. And all you have to do is Check a box, okay? You check a box. Yes, I am a U.S. citizen. You check that box. Nobody's going to come verify that. Not on a mail-in ballot. They're not going to verify the signature. They're not going to verify the person that checked that box is actually an American citizen. They're not going to do either one of those things. So, but the good news is we can see what they're trying, okay? And Trump seemed pretty confident. Uh, he said several times at his recent rally, there are safeguards in place now. We put safeguards in place. And, and so I think he has he 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 has some idea what they're gonna try to do. And there will be well, some why don't they have more why don't more states have uh ID requirements and all that? Why why are they still, you know, if they're why don't they, why are they doing more at the state level right now to start returning to uh, secure elections? I, I see this as having the opposite effect that Merck Garland intends. When he's coming here, they see uh, a lot of uh, Americans are a country that, that do not like to be dictated to. When the federal government comes into one of these states and, and, and goes, uh, uh, you can't actually ask voters. It's wrong. It's racist for you to ask voters to show ID to vote. Um, locals don't like that. Uh, they don't like that. And I, I see this actually backfiring on Garland when he comes in and he tries to, this is just the states that already have it. They're not going to be successful. And I I, I I, can see states with uh, 
that don't have it start wondering about it. Why is it so important to the swamp that nobody saw an ID to vote? Why they why Matt Garland sending DOJ people to our 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 uh, Secretary of State office in our state trying to set it up so that we we don't ever ask for ID for people to vote? Why why yeah. does it matter to them so much? I see it just caused attention to this. Yeah, I think it's going to backfire. So, what's your prediction for this year? What do you expect to see for politically any events, the wars? Just what's your overall assessment of things? Ukraine war is over. Um, I actually think most of what you're seeing out there uh, supposedly come. You know, it's just so weird thing about the Ukraine war. We've had wars where we had extensive TV coverage. There are cameras everywhere. Um, I remember the first the, the first two Iraq wars. You know, we went in there the first time when Saddam invaded Kuwait, and when we went in the second time, two thousand six. I remember how war is covered when when you have an actual media on the ground there, and we only know what we're told about this Ukraine war. We're not allowed to see hardly any of it, and so most of what people think they know about that conflict yeah. is not real. I think it's yeah. a, it's, a, it's a media creation. And uh, Putin already announced that he he achieved his objectives. He you remember they did the victory parade like it was over a year ago. He announced that he had he taken out all the neo Nazi units out of the eastern half of the country. He destroyed all the bio labs. He said, "Great, had a victory parade." He's just waiting for uh, Zelensky to get around to acknowledging that he lost. Okay, so. And now, this just uh, like a week ago, the CIA and a duck bed to try to keep the money coming, you know, because uh, R- Russian space lasers didn't get the trick done. So, oh, my God, we have to send $60 more billion to Ukraine to get Congress to pass the bill. We have to send $60 more billion because, hey, Russian space nukes. Okay, and, well, that, that kind of fell apart pretty quick. It was, oh, oh. Putin just killed Navalny. He just killed that opposition leader in jail. Yeah. Got to send Ukraine sixty billion dollars, and well, that didn't go anywhere either. Okay, so all of a sudden, the CIA decides to bring in a New York Times reporter. Here's our twelve secret bases that we that we have on the uh, border of the Donbass, where all of the neo-Nazi werewolf. Operation Gladio units we created and trained, and we've been directing. We this is 2014. We've been sending them into the Donbass to attack and commit war crimes against the ethnic Russians in the Donbass. Here's our 12 bases. We're not going to be able to keep these bases now. You guys have to send us the money, or the CIA won't be able to keep doing its valuable work with yeah. these neo-Nazi units. And the and the uh, okay, and so this whole thing is ludicrous. It's we the point it's absolutely freaking ludicrous. Wow. Well, Brian, it's been a pleasure talking with you, and uh, I want to thank you for coming on during your uh, birthday today and celebrate some of the things you've been uh, working on and investigating the different stories. Uh, I think we've done a good overview of some of the different topics that you've been covering. I know you do a lot of other things like the lies about the food. Uh, FDA and the food system. That's a huge thing that we talk about on the show. So maybe we'll do that again another time. How about that? Well, well, thanks, Danny. You can have me back anytime. But by the way, I want to thank you on your new wrestling career because that looks like it's off to a promising start. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I, I look forward to uh, doing more with that as well. BrianCates.substack.com. Thank you, sir, for coming on. Thank you. I enjoyed being here. Let's do it again soon. All right.